Good morning, church family. We're so happy that you came to join us this morning here at Culture Church. My name is Lena. I'm a serving member at Culture Church and a family member because when we are under one body of Christ, we are all family. Amen. We really hope that you you uh, enjoy the sermon and that you're just doing well um, with your health and your sanity. Hey, guys, before we get started, uh, there's a few announcements that I have for you. Uh, for some things that are coming up in the next week. The first is uh, there has been such a success with our ladies Bible study. We had about 17 women online on Zoom and uh, the feedback I heard was awesome. Uh, well, you know, I got to know what's going on. So I kind of poked my head in a little bit, say hello to from folks. Not that I really needed to know what was going on, but I just needed to see some other people. So it was kind of cool. I got to see a few other people say hello, but it was such a great time that we are going to do the same thing for the men. <clears throat> Coming up this Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we'll uh, send out a text message to the men. Uh, we'll send out... Uh, and uh, email probably, uh, and it'll tell you how you can connect on Zoom. If you need help connecting on Zoom, reach out to us. Let us know so that we can uh, tell you how to get hooked up on that whole video conferencing thing. I tell you, you know, Zoom stock must be going literally through the roof because that's all you hear on TV, on news, is <clears throat> the Zoom video conferencing. And I have to tell you, it is kind of cool. So uh, that's the first thing. That's going to be this Wednesday. Uh, at seven o'clock, we're going to have a men's Bible study. We're going to continue into a our discussion with John. Now we're a little behind than where we are in the church, but that's cool. For those of you that have the book by Max Licato, uh, we're going through the book of John. We're on chapter seven. Uh, in the book Bible itself, we are going to be on chapter nine. So <clears throat> please, if you want to be a part of that, let us know. You can email us at info at culturechurch.org uh, and we can get in touch with you from that and we'll let you know how you can join in on this week's men's bible study zoom call uh, we'll try to make it interactive as we always do uh, this isn't about a teaching or a lecturing it's about us just kind of digging through the word a little bit and hearing what your feedback is and um, what you feel as though the holy spirit's leading you in his word the other thing is this wednesday is the national day of prayer now, I know many of you are going to be uh, tuning in to other services. You're going to uh, be tuning in on uh, streaming services for different churches, and that's great. Um, and, and our prayers are with them, and our prayers are that. hope that everything goes smooth with that. But we, at Culture Church, like we did last year, we want to uh, have people get out out into the community and we want you to go to your local municipality to your police departments to your local um you know where your mayor's office is and pray there and your fire departments your schools and most of all we want you to get out <clears throat> and go to the hospitals because that's where they're feeling the brunt of this whole COVID-19 thing so get out there and uh, let's pray for those people in those areas and um, we can just blanket our communities wherever you live whoever's watching and listening I, I challenge you some point on Thursday no specific time anytime just step out maybe you and your wife your your brother your sister get in a car if you don't feel comfortable getting out your car sit in your car and let's just say a prayer in those places in your police departments your municipalities in your hospitals your fire departments and schools and let's just ask for one for god's guidance and for two that he would continue to uh, preserve his truth in this country so those are the two things men's bible study and our national day of prayer at this time i'm going to ask lena to come and she's going to open up our service with a little bit of a prayer lena will you take a moment and pray with me for the service 
Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day, Lord. Thank you that we can still come together, um, even if it's virtually, just to praise you, Lord, and to hear your word. I pray over Pastor John today as he um, just allows you to speak through him, Lord. Um, open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to hear what you have to say during this um, crazy time in our life right uh, right now, Lord. Um, I just pray that you continue to keep us uh, safe and well and healthy, and for those that are struggling with um, anything during this pandemic, specifically anybody struggling with COVID-19, Lord, I just pray that your um, hedge protection on them and their family, Lord, help them to uh, just heal, Lord, and um, get through this together. Um, we just thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. So um, we're going to continue on. Uh, this is just uh, I wanted to do a little two week thing about this whole COVID situation. Uh, and that's where we're going to continue with today. Uh, last week, we talked a little bit about what COVID was. Um, we talked about uh, the name COVID. Where did it come from? Uh, that it's a coronavirus that was founded that happened in 2019. We saw that. And um, we even looked at how we can prevent it. The steps that we can take. What can we do? Masks, social distancing, sheltering in place, uh, just being more aware of our surroundings. And um, I, as I shared, uh, I keep a little bottle of alcohol and I just spray my hands before I get in my car if I have to go out. Um, maybe take an extra shower or two. Whatever the case may be, that's just our part. The other thing we looked at was dealing with the anxiety and fear that comes from COVID. Because when you're dealing with a situation like this, and really there's not a whole lot of information, there's not, uh, they're just starting to get some better idea on the, on the, on the realities of this virus and uh, how it works and, and then maybe how to combat it. I've even heard this week, which brought me a little hope that they're testing, the SDA did an emergency uh, uh, approval of a drug um, that they're gonna that they tried to use on a couple patients um, but ultimately um, this type of a thing causes anxiety and fear of that and we've talked about you can look in the Word of God to help us with that we saw in Philippians 4 what God calls the recipe I call it the recipe I feel that's what he gave me the recipe for dealing with anxiety and fear and the first thing is to pray about our problem Let's come together, let's hold hands individually, whatever it is, take your situation to God with thanksgiving. Because he's the one that can deal with it. He's the one that can truly fix it. So that's the first thing, just pray about the problem. And once you come out of that prayer, a lot of times you feel a little bit better. You, the, the weight might be leaving lifted, but you know what? When you open your eyes, that monster is still there. So. The next part in that scripture in, John, in uh, Philippians 4 tells us to think on these things. And all of those things point to Christ. So really, if we focus our energies on Him and not the problem, then the Bible tells us there in Philippians 4 that we can gain peace. A peace that only comes from God. Don't focus on the issues. Focus on Him. Now, the thing that happened for me was when I was doing my little research for last year, last week's discussion, realizing that this coronavirus, Corona, Rona, there's all these different names for it, um, that it wasn't new, that it had been around since the 1930s, that actually gave me a little hope. Because understanding the fact that they've seen this type of a thing before, and there's a good chance that they'll be able to figure out how to fix the problem, that brought me a little bit of hope, and it settled me down a little bit. Now, if we just continue in that idea, let's just continue down that thought process of gaining knowledge, gaining an education, or an understanding about a situation. Gaining knowledge, gaining understanding, getting an education about a situation that can help us deal with the, 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 the mind games that happen when we experience life this way. But I use the word can because it doesn't have to. Everything still goes off of our mind and how we process what we experience. So here we can let this help us 
but we cannot let this help us. So as we move on in this week's discussion, I want you to keep that in mind, that really it's that part of it is up to us. Philippians 4 is God's way of showing us that we're going to be okay, that he's got it under control. He gave us the recipe. Now it's our part to put that in action, and maybe we're going to learn something today, but we have to know that it's up to us. If this doesn't work, many times it's because of us and our own understanding. So before we get fully into this, but I want to talk a little bit about this whole COVID-19 thing. There's all this stuff going on that this is an end times thing like, oh my gosh, we're heading toward end times. Now, for those of you that don't know what end times is, from the time that Jesus came to the time he died, he talked about uh, there's going to be a time coming when all this stuff is going to get fixed. All the problems in the world, and, and, and we call that the end times. Now, the end times started from the time of Christ until the time he comes back. That's the span of time that really encompasses end time, what we call theology or the study of end times. But there's been a progression of things that have happened throughout history that we can look at that point to end times. Things that we would say from a biblical standpoint that point to Jesus coming back and all these things happening. One of the first things we can think about from a biblical sense. Now, though, these are biblical prophecies that have truly been that have happened or um, have been foretold to happen. One of the first things is, is that the Bible has been translated in nearly every language around the world. Now, why is that important? Because there's scripture that talk about when the, when the message goes out to everyone, then the end is coming. So it's, it's like, whoa, the Bible went from just for this little group of people in this little part of the world to remember the Gutenberg press and remember uh, Germany and how they uh, all of a sudden began to, through uh, Martin Luther, began to change that and all of a sudden the Bible was translated so that people could read it and understand it. So that was a that's a that's a biblical sign because now that the the Bible is you can, listen you can pull up your app and doot, doot, doot on Bob Gateway and you can hit it in any language you want. So now that that's happened, that is a a true precursor to uh, the end coming. The other thing is, which was a biggie, is that Israel became a nation. Now why is that such a big deal? Because you got this little tiny country tiny little country that's totally surrounded by people that don't like them. And from time before Christ to the time after Christ, they've been in the country, they were out of the country, they were scattered. We know what went on in the Holocaust and, and, and how horrible that was. But the thing is, is that through all of that time, they came back to Israel and they were established as a sovereign nation. As, as, a, as a true country governing themselves. That was a big deal because that was a promise that God made that he would gather them back and they would free form a country. Now, they hadn't had rule all throughout the 18 and early 1900s. Around the middle of 1900s, 1948 or so, they became a country. That was a true, true marker that the end is coming. Now, I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm just showing you some progression of biblical things. The other thing that I think about is the United Nations coming into existence. What the United Nations did was they came together and they invited the countries to come and say, let's sit down and let's talk about the things that are going on in the world. So, what they, so now they have this building and they sit around and all the delegates sit there and they discuss the world problems. Now, how does that fit into biblical prophecy? Because part of the thing that's going to happen in the end, because there's going to be these seven kingdoms that have happened throughout history, six have already happened, and the seventh is to come, and that's the kingdom of the Antichrist. Now, in that, it talks about there being one world government, 
one world religion, one world money, one world everything. How can that happen if all the individuals are doing their own thing? So that's why I look at the United Nations as a, as a, as a precursor to tell us that, hey, you know what, the stage is being set, that things are being set up for that end thing that we read about in the Bible. Not that the United Nations is bad. It's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I can see it happening. The other thing, and this is uh, something that is kind of like become second nature today is the World Wide Web. www dot whatever, right? I remember my first time getting on the internet. It must have been 1998 or 99. I had built my first computer and you know the dial-up thing, you, you plugged it into doo -doo 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 -doo, oh, I made all these weird noises but I was able to for the first time see the Sistine Chapel. Like, I could, they had a picture of it and I was able to scroll around. Of course it moved like this. But I was able to see it. The World Wide Web. So what that did was that united the world, just like the United Nations united the world from a political sense, the World Wide Web, it united the world from a visual sense. All of a sudden, for the first time, you could see things and events happen around the world right away. I've talked about this before. I remember a few years ago, I stumbled upon a website, and it's called the Kotel, or I don't know how to pronounce Hebrew words, but it's K-O-T-E-L, and it's a live feed from the Wailing Wall. Right now, you can go to it, and you can see people standing at the Wailing Wall, praying and walking around, and it's like, whoa. Israel in my house on my TV right now, the World Wide Web. So that's why I think these are some progressive things that have happened throughout history that are fulfilling God's prophecy about coming of end times. Now there's some other events that can set the stage for what would seem to be end time events. Now these are just things that have happened maybe in our country or what have you, and they're just things that have happened and we can say, wow, I can kind of see how that can point to it. Not that it is. I'm not trying to, this isn't a message about doom and gloom and you better repent, you're gonna go to hell, that's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying is I'm looking at some things that have happened and I'm drawing some conclusions from them uh, as they line up with the Bible. So I think that um, one of the first things I can think about in this country is that when we left the gold standard. Now, for those that don't really know what the gold standard is, there was a time that for every dollar that we had, we had to have gold to line up to that dollar. Now, what happened was, the Great Depression happened and they knew they had to do something to stimulate the economy, kind of like what we just did during this COVID thing. So during the Depression, they decided to say, well, you know what, we are going to print more money so that we can put it back into the system. Even though we may not have the amount of gold to do so, we're going to do it. And that happened back during the Depression and somewhere around 1971 or so, we completely walked away from the gold standard, meaning that our money that we have that is produced in this country is no longer attached to the amount of gold that we have because you couldn't mine enough gold uh, to keep up with the dollar demand. Now, how does that tie into everything? Because, because we did that, that began a, that put us in a place where we could begin to overspend. And that happened on a global scale. It wasn't just America that walked away from the gold standard. That happened around the world. So now we have all of this debt. We owe this country that. They owe us this. Everybody owes everybody. And it's not really based off of gold. It's just based off of money that it's really based off of our own name and our own reputation, if you, if you will. It's not really based off of, we can't back it up with pounds and pounds of gold. It's almost like, hey, trust me, we got you. You know me, I, I got you, don't worry. So that was us leaving the gold standard. The other thing was 
Now, these are just things that have happened in our, in our lifetime. 9-11 empowered an organization called the TSA to really, ra and listen, I, when I go through the airports, I thank my TSA officers. Because you know what? Some of them have little scowls on their face. Some of them are. Some of them are pretty cool. Um, I've dealt with both. But for me, it's like, I know I don't have anything. I ain't got nothing crazy in my pockets, in my bag, even though they threw away my brand new lotion one time. It was some Nevia, some expensive stuff. Threw it right away, but that's okay. But the bottom line is I thank them because if they're not doing their job, then I don't fly safely. And they're doing their job. But they've been so empowered that um, I think that this is going to all be a way for uh, governments to really control a lot of this stuff that was a private type of a thing. The last thing is, is COVID. COVID-19 specifically. This thing shut the world down. It shut the world down. Just like I said, TSA is everywhere. Like, it's TSA here, but if I go to another country, they got their own TSA. But COVID shut the world down. And I think that it changed everything. And however we come out of this thing, I think that there's going to be a difference. That it, Things are not going to be the way they were. No matter how much we might want to, it's not going to be the same. There's going to be something that changes. Remember 9-11. Remember uh, all those other things that we quickly talked about, how they made a change. I remember in the state of New Jersey, um, and, and what I mean by a change that doesn't get reversed I remember in New Jersey here, when I first started coming over here, I was dating my wife. I had never really came to Jersey. I was from Philly. There was enough things popping in Philly. I didn't need to come to Jersey. But I came to Jersey because there was this fine woman there, you know, whatever. And um, the first thing that blew me away was I didn't have to pump my own gas. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling this. I don't have to pump. It's 30 degrees outside. I just roll the window down, slide in my cash. I'm out. The other thing that was awesome was the gas was cheaper than it was in Philly. Now, I remember a few years ago, all of a sudden, they instituted some new gasoline tax, and our gas shot up 20, 25 cents or something like that. And it will never rebound from that. Now, COVID comes and our gas is below $2, and I didn't think we would see below $2 again. But for the most part, our gas is a lot higher than it was. Something happened, a change happened, and we never will go back to what it was. And that's kind of what I think is going to happen with this COVID thing. And that's why I say it's a, it's a sign. It's something that kind of can point to end times because one little thing happened and the world was totally affected by it. The world. Now, these other things that I talked about, like the gold standard, 9-11, even the COVID situation, telling us we've got to stay, and I know there's all these different issues. There's sides that say, hey, this is unconstitutional. People are saying, hey, you know what, uh, this, uh, we, we have to do something because people are getting sick and dying. I understand it. All I know is, is that I don't believe that, that, this, that these decisions were made maliciously. I don't believe so. But... Things will be changed, and I believe that these things can look like, as I said, end time events. Now, just because something looks like it, that doesn't mean that it is. Just because it looks like the end is coming, is it? John don't say. I don't know. All I can say is that these things definitely can be looked at as setting the stage. But the true idea is, should that be our focus? When we're looking at these things in life, especially when you're looking at this stuff that has affected us globally, should that be our focus, whether this is the end times or not? The Bible tells us that things are going to happen. Listen, it, it's very clear. The world is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Famine. Wars. Satan's going to establish his kingdom. Christians are going to get persecuted. Now, I pray, I pray that from these things happening that there's one more great revival in my time that all of a sudden the world will turn to god one more time i don't know that but as i said i don't think that should be our focus because what happens is if we focus on that if we focus on the the the, the stuff the, the 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 
things that happen and look at them and say, whoa, the end is so near, I, 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 it can cause fear and anxiety. Every time something happens, anytime something happens and it looks like something we've read about in the Bible, or we, then all of a sudden we get fear and anxious. Not saying that it's not, I'm just saying our response has to be different. Because what happens is our basic survival instinct kicks in and we want to live. But we have to submit to God's plan in everything. Now, as I said, education and understanding can help us. Now, let me walk through this process of how education and understanding can help us when fear and anxiety grip us. Because really, I think that's where we are in the sense of this COVID thing. Because, oh yeah, we're all excited. This weekend, parks are open again. Uh, Saturday was a gorgeous day. People got out. That's a beautiful thing. But you know what? Even if they start to open restaurants again, if a restaurant was used to seating 100 people but can only seat 30 people, how many people are going to still have jobs? How much money is that going to produce? So it still leads to questions that can create fear and anxiety. So I believe that education and understanding can help, as I said, if we let it. Now, let me walk through this a little bit. If I'm going to reduce anxiety, education and understanding is key because it gives us a point that we can fixate on. Because right now, all we're doing is fixating on the problem. So when I understand and I have some education about something, it, it changes what I am uh, fixating on. It changes the object of my focus. And now that I've changed my object of my focus, that then produce, that helps me to work harder. I, 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 Because I'm not focused on the fear, or I'm not focused on the problem, I can just keep moving. I'm not wasting my energy spinning my wheels anymore. I'm doing something. So it helps me to work harder and smarter and more efficiently. The next thing that happens is it builds our faith. See, something challenging happens and I gain good understanding, good education about it, then I work harder, I work smarter, I work better, then it builds my faith. Because you know what? There's always going to be something that happens. Something is always going to come up. It's just what it is. Something's going to happen. And when it happens, I can reflect back on the last time that something happened and I say, whoa, I feel, I feel anxiety, I feel fear, I, I feel this stuff happening again. But you know what? I remember I gained a biblical understanding and you know what? That situation worked out. So I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to trip out. Because when you give in to it, as we're going to see here, poor behavior comes. So I'm not going to trip out. I'm not going to freak out. I'm going to trust God that he has the answer that has built my faith. Now, I keep saying this fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety is really the, the, the core of all of this. So for fear and anxiety to exist, I believe that there are two parts to fear and anxiety. There's two pieces. The first is it has to have an object. It has to have something to fear and be anxious about. For in, the, in our situation today, it's COVID. Maybe when COVID's over, it could be your job from COVID. Maybe it's uh, you couldn't pay your mortgage for three months and they gave you the ability to, to hold off, but now the three months is over and they want all their money up front, which is wild and crazy to me. But that's okay. God's going to handle that too. So there has to be an object of our fear. There has to be a situation or something that we're feared and we're anxious about. A thing. Something. The next is my perception about that thing. What did I just see? How did I process what I just saw? What, did, what, what went through my mind? What is going through my mind? Every time I lay my head down, I can't sleep. Why? Because it's going through my mind. Every time I get up, it's on my mind. That's all my focus has been. So I believe that the union of an object and a, per, and a perception 
can produce something called a result. Those three things are the things that work off of fear and anxiety. I notice something, I experience something, I think this about it, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to act like that. I remember when I was in boot camp, and I might have told this before, but I, I, I was a little older. I was 20, almost 22 when I went in. Not that I was, you know what I mean, but I was a little older than some 18-year-old guy right out of high school. But I remember I got there, and um, I had some good dudes in my troop. We, you know, we were, we were, in my, my company was pretty solid. But it was weird, like, all of a sudden I noticed that the people that were promoted to, like, the leadership in our company were, like, some of the weaker guys. And listen, I'm not trying to front like I was Go Joe, you know, like I was G.I. Joe dude. It wasn't that. But I, I knew that there were guys that were a lot more, that were a lot stronger, that could have done better in those positions. And because that was the case, there were a lot of things that we lacked. Because leadership is everything in any organization. In any kind of team, leadership is everything. So we, were, we, we kept losing competitions. We would screw up marching. Guy that was calling cadence couldn't call cadence right. We'd be messed up and, and all that kind of stuff. And it would frustrate me to no end. It, it, it would drive me absolutely crazy. And then all of a sudden, I got so crazy. Because they started talking about setting us backwards. Like, okay, we're on week four. We're going to push you back to week two. Like, Hold on now. I'm not going backwards. Put me out of here before I go backwards. So I ended up having requesting a meeting with my company commander. This was somewhere around week five, week six, or something like that. And I said to him, I said, I, I really don't understand. This doesn't really make sense to me. Help me understand what's going on here. Why does it seem like, and I'm trying not to put people down. He said, listen, I understand. He said, I've always wanted to try something. He said, the question that I have is, can the weaker person be strengthened by the whole group. If you have a group of people and everybody knows what's going on, everybody knows what needs to be done, and you might have a little bit of a weaker leader, but would they be able to empower that leader to become a better leader? Because if they do, then what you just produced is another leader. If not, if you just have, say, three people in a group that can lead, but a weaker person never gets trained or never gets taught how to lead, then they don't ever step up and become a leader themselves. So all you end up with is just three leaders. But imagine if you can double that and have six leaders, then do you know what? You're produ all of a sudden, my mind went crazy. Now, what was the process? What was frustrating me? What was causing fear and anxiety in me? What was causing fear was the object was our poor team performance. Our, our company was so bad we lost all our flags. The perception was that my leadership, even all the way up to the company commanders, were horrible. Like, I'm like, dude, like y'all are tripping. You put the wrong people in, in, in place. Not that I was strong enough, but hey, I had my little lead. I was in charge of the flag dudes or whatever. So that was my perception. So what was the result? And I argue with the leadership all the time, not the company commanders. They make you do push-ups to the cow. That, that, that's not it. But to the regular leadership, I was defiant, which brought shame. I was ignorant to them. But once I understood, once I gained some understanding about what he was trying to accomplish, all of a sudden, it made sense to me. And then, when poor decisions were made, I didn't freak out anymore. I didn't wild out anymore. In fact, what I did was, I, I began to support it. And maybe I worked a little harder. Maybe I helped my bunk mate a little bit better. Or some, or if, I'll give you a prime example. We're marching and he called the wrong cadence. I'm in charge of the flag guys. I'm in front. So, even though he said the wrong thing, me and the other guy, we just did the right thing. So, it never looked like we were wrong. And it worked. Toward the end, all of a sudden, no, we didn't gain all our flags and we didn't look crazy. We didn't look super decorated, but you know what? We knew what was going on. We could march. We could march without even a cadence because we knew what was happening. Our, our leader was better. Our group was better. 
Didn't look like it, but we were. But anyway, today, the object of our fear and our anxiety is COVID. That's the object of our issue. Our perception is that all the stories that we've made up in our mind, I'm going to get sick and die, blah, blah, whatever. You, you know what you've thought about. All those different stories that we've made up in our mind concerning COVID will create us to have a poor result. If our perception is off. When the object of our fear and anxiety, when, when the thing that we've looked, when we look at that thing and our perception is off and it's negative, you know what that object then becomes? Because the object is what it is. When that object that we look at and we're perceiving, when our, when our, when our perception is off about that object, then that object turns into a distraction. It's a distraction now. Now, what is a distraction? I, I looked up some quick words. You know what some uh, words, they call them synonyms. It really just means another word that means the same thing. We, words that mean the same thing as a distraction, here are a few of them. Aberration. Complication. Disturbance. Confusion. Diversion. Interference. Interruption. Whoa, those words got kind of serious. Aberration is like... Like, like uh, something fake or something. Now here are some words that mean, the sa that mean the opposite of distraction. Calm, calmness, order, peace, even labor, profession, task, and work. These are all words that mean the opposite of distraction. I mean, that's a, that just kind of blew my mind just looking at from a word standpoint. But the truth is, in these type of situations, distractions are meant to shield us from what's really going on. You know, I, I used to do this car trip with my kids. I, I don't know if I ever showed you this, but it, you take a little card and, I, and, I, I, and I'd be waving them. I'd say, yeah, well, this is a card, this, that, and the other thing. And I would go like this, and then the card would look like it disappeared. And then I would do that, and the card looked like it came back. Well, really, when you do that trick... You're really because you're over here doing something creepy with your hand and you're trying to fool them. That's the whole idea. Masters of Illusion use things like that to distract us because they're doing something over here, turning the page, I don't know, whatever. They're doing whatever over here and they're using this thing here to throw you off. Distractions are designed for us to focus on one thing while something else is happening. Today, I want us to turn in the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And we're going to read a scripture that many of us have read, especially coming out of our Easter season. And I want you to listen for the distraction. Think of where the distraction comes. Because if we can begin to pinpoint where the distraction comes, it will help us as we are dealing with situations that happen in our life. Turn to chapter 16. Now, what's going on here, before we just read it, what's going on here? Jesus, before they even took their last little pilgrimage back to uh, Jerusalem, they're still hanging out around Galilee, chilling and all that, and God begins to tell them he's preparing them for what's about to happen. So he was always doing these little things to help them. So let's look at verse 21 in Matthew 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day, be raised to life. Peter took him aside. So God, Jesus tells them and says, listen, we got to head to Jerusalem, and when we get there, I'm going to suffer. And I'm going to die, but don't worry, I'm going to be raised again. Here's Peter's response. Peter took him to the side, verse 22. And he says he began to rebuke him. Now, I looked up that word rebuke, and we think of rebuke like, you know, like, we, like we're scolding him. And, and really the feeling is, is that he's just kind of talking to him, kind of like saying, you know, just more just talking. Peter took him aside and said, Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. 
you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Where's the, where, 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 what is happening? What, all right, let's walk through it. Where's the object? What is the thing? The thing is, yep, that's right, that Jesus said that he had to die and suffer. That was the thing. And actually, it hadn't even happened yet, but he was telling them, kind of like us, right? We're looking toward this end time thing, and we're trying to figure out uh, uh, what's happening here. So Jesus is telling them something's going to happen. That becomes the object. Now, look at the perception. What's the perception? Peter took him aside and said, Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. See, the perception, how he viewed what just happened, was going through his own filter in his own mind. And his own filter in his own mind said, I have found him. If this is the Messiah, I don't want him to go away. Because all my Christian or all my Jewish life, I've read that Messiah's kingdom is going to be established on the throne of David and it'll never go away. If this is him, then how can this happen? How can he die? And, and how can, how can this, I can't allow this to happen. So that's why Peter kind of put, yo, you know, this should never happen to you. Look what Jesus says. Here comes the education. Now, the result, Jesus brought, dropped some education, but sometimes we can learn something today, but it doesn't stick. It may take some time for it to come back and help us to understand. Because we know this is the same guy, Peter, that when they did finally happen and the, and the soldiers showed up, what did he do? He cut the ear off of the guy that came to take Jesus away. But look how Jesus handles this. Jesus says, get, the, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have the mind, you don't have in mind the, the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus rebukes Satan, but he kind of encourages his friend. That, that's really what's happening here, because what happens is when fear and anxiety begin to take over our life, they're, they're, it, it creates a result. Right? And, and the result, because it's fear and anxiety, that's not of God, right? What did the Bible tell us? That God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. So if, he's, if fear and anxiety begin to take you over, then your reactions are not going to be godly. Your reactions are going to be earthly. And in those reactions, in that type of atmosphere, that's a perfect setup for you to begin to live out not God's will, but Satan's will. For, for your life. It will cause you, remember me back in boot camp, I was disrespectful to the leadership. I was defiant. I still do what I had to do, but I wasn't going to go out of my way. And that's what happened here. Peter's perception of the object of Jesus dying was off. And it turned the object of him dying in from what it was supposed to be. The very thing that we get excited, that we, are, that we shout about, that we sing about. And it turned into a distraction. And it hid the true agenda for the purpose of the object. And then that would give Satan a foothold in Peter's life. And Jesus rebuked Satan because of it. Other things that he said to Peter, remember, Peter, he said, Peter, Satan desired to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you because he knew that he was going to establish something through Peter. He knew that come Acts 2, the Holy Spirit would fall on Peter and he would give a message that would transform the lives of thousands of people. He knew that. Peter didn't understand that. He didn't understand that this thing that Jesus had just told him, the object of their situation, that it was really going to change everything for all time. He didn't understand that. Let me close here. Think about this. I couldn't think of a better acronym, so I just called it what it is. OPR. Object. Things are going to happen. Objects are just stuff that happens, and it becomes an object. And we can't change stuff from happening. It's going to happen, good, bad, or indifferent. Stuff's going to happen. 
This can happen in something good. Your perception of something good could be, hey, this good happened to me. Why did it happen to me? Because I was a good boy. Hmm, maybe. But if that's how you live your life, that if I do good, good's gonna happen, well, what happens if bad happens to me? Then you start to question your goodness. Our righteousness comes from Christ. And it's because of our understanding of that, that we try to live a life that's pleasing to him. Not but to get something, but because we understand the love and relationship that he has with us. Object of things, stuff is going to happen. We can't change that. Perception. Our thought processes. How do we process what we see? Here's the thing, how do I process it? How do I deal with that? I don't understand it, I, I, I don't, I, I can't wrap my mind around it, but it's here. Now, if I, if, it allow, if I allow my perception of this thing to create fear and anxiety in me, I gotta do an about face, turn around and start over. Rethink my process. Go back and say, okay, God, I was going down a fear and anxiety route. Show me here, because I don't want this to become a distraction. And produce what? A poor result. If my perception is off, then my result will be off. Your result is a direct reflection of who you've listened to. Peter heard the most glorious news he would have ever heard in his life. And his perception was off. So he tried to rebuke Christ for it. He tried to tell him, no, this can't happen. Instead of saying, wow, Lord, you're, you're dying for me. You're, you're, you're paying for every wrong thing that I've ever done. How can I fit in to that picture? Who are you going to listen to? as fear and anxiety starts to happen around something that has happened. God said all things work for our good. All things. We have to look back and remember what God has done. That's our only tool to help us slow down and, 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 and not go down that road. Look at what he's done. I didn't understand it when I was going into the situation, but as I began to go through it, and, and, and I, even though I didn't fully understand, and I may never remember, Job never understood, but he did know that he couldn't curse God as his wife had asked him to. So now as I'm going through something, I, I can't curse him. I, I just have to trust him. I have to have faith. And that grows with every experience, with every object that we face, with everything that we come up against. That will grow, that will be magnified. I gotta trust God. Look to Him when I'm facing these objects of life so that they do not become distractions. Once they do, my actions change and they become wrong. There's more than we know that's going on. There was more going on than I knew in boot camp. There was more going on than what Peter heard that day. And if I know that God himself is working on my behalf to glorify himself and I'm his, I don't have nothing to worry about. I don't have to react. And you know what? If I don't hear anything else, if, 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 if God never shows up and tells me exactly why I'm dealing with what I'm dealing, if that never happens, but I know that he's working on my behalf, I know that he's with me, as he told uh, uh, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Why? Because I am with you. If I know that piece of knowledge says that I can, I'll be okay. That piece of knowledge should slow me down from running down the fear and anxiety path. Once I slow down and I know that he's working, then I can turn to him and say, okay, Lord, how do I fit into your plan? 
Once Peter got past all that, after he finished cutting folks' ears off, after, listen, this is a prime example that his education didn't come until it was fully time. Once he was done all that, Jesus died, Jesus rose from the dead, appeared before his disciples, and before he went back to heaven, he had a little private conversation with Peter. And when that was done, he says, okay, I, I, all right, I see where I fit in your plan. I'm supposed to tell them. I'm supposed to go and tell the world. And when you do that, all of a sudden, you will watch your fear and your anxiety leave. Again, we thank you so much for listening today with us and for those of you who are new to the faith or just trying to figure out what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus um, I can share that with you today and it's as simple as four little symbols um, we we have these four little symbols and the heart just means that Jesus loves us he loves us regardless of where we're at in life he wants you to come as you are right now you don't have to uh, be anybody else but yourself when you come to Jesus and the little division sign is just the fact that there's sin in this world and it separates us from Jesus and um, thank God we have the cross you know we have Jesus who died on the cross um, shed his blood and he sacrificed himself in order for us to be able to have a direct relationship with Jesus and God and then the question mark is just as simple as Will you trust him? Will you accept him into your heart and um, build that relationship with him and um, just talk with him and grow with him? Allow him to lead your steps. Um, so if you would just follow me in this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for um, anybody that is um, just you're opening their heart, Lord, and that they're interested in seeking you, Lord. We just pray that um, you help them in their walk with you, Lord, that um, they're able to accept you um, into their heart, Lord, and really acknowledge um, who you are and what you've done for us, Lord. I just pray that you help them grow in their first beginning steps of this relationship, Lord, and um, just give them many blessings. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.